year Julian has been confined in a small building, not as big as this, a small embassy in Knightsbridge, in a situation of sensory deprivation. Now I'm a former prisoner and I know what custody is like, I know what confinement is like. My last handcuff was in Bogoro Jail in 1988. I served 13 months in jail in the United States for a non-violent disabling of a decent to bomber. I can only understand you people as zombies with no empathy. Australian zombies with no empathy. Not having empathy leads to fascism. They could easily take away the Jews, the Gypsies and the Communists because people like you have no empathy for the other. Now what's strange about Julian Assange is that he is a white boy. When Australians are asked to kill the Vietnamese, they kill the Vietnamese. When the Australians are asked to kill the Arabs, they kill the Arabs. When the Australians are asked to invade Turkey, that they never had a problem with, they go and kill the Turks. That is the history of Australia. The history of Australia is serving empire. Australians are sycophants to empire. Australians, I'm one of them, find their security not in peace and justice, not in finding reconciliation with the Aboriginal people, they find it in serving empire. First they served the British Empire. The first military engagement, Australian soldiers went to kill the Maori. They went to kill the Maori, but the Maori were too tough. They were a warrior tribe and they were not defeated and they had the Treaty of Waitangi, something the Australian Aborigines were denied. They've been recognition of their humanity till 1968. Australian Aborigines were not considered citizens of this country, but the racist apartheid country. When I was eight years of age, Australian Aborigines, although they were used as cannon fodder in World War I and Korea and Vietnam by the Australian military, but did not have the right to vote. When I was 13 in Queensland, it was still illegal to cohabitate with a native under the Vagrancy Act in Queensland. When I went to jail for the first time in Queensland, although Aborigines make up less than 2% of the population, they still make up 30% of the prison population. When I was in jail in Darwin, it was 95% Indigenous prisoners and over 95%. All you can see here before you are zombies. Yuppie zombies who have no empathy for the people their government kill, who have no courage, like Julian Assange has, has courage. Julian Assange has courage of plenty. The Guardian Liberal media try and present Julian as some kind of alien, some kind of narcissistic, hyper-intelligent alien. Julian Assange is a true Australian. He was born in the racist city of Townsville, named after the racist man town who took Kanakis as slaves to Queensland to cut the cane. Then we have zombies here tonight. Zombies who cannot even hear me. Zombies who, who occupy a bubble of white privilege as they go into this building. Zombies who let their government bomb Syrian troops in the last few months, who let their government destroy Iraq with sanctions in the 90s. The Australian Navy enforced those sanctions. The Australian cowards in the earth and the Australian military killed from above. They don't get it nice and close. When my grandfather killed a British soldier in his own town in Kilbegan, he got in nice and close. The Australians kill like cowards. They kill with napalm, they kill with jets that are sold by the Americans. This is the Australians you see before you. Cowards and zombies. But there's one Australian in this city that has courage and integrity. And he is confined without charge for six years. I visit Julian. Julian is a friend of mine. I've seen his health deteriorate. But these Australians, they don't care about him. That's not a shock. They don't care about Aboriginal people who they've raped, and they've invaded and they've stolen from. That's their country. It's one of it's one of Aboriginal genocide and Irish slave labour and slaves that were collected here in the East End. That's where you get the phrase kangaroo courts from. Kangaroo courts is not a phrase you hear in Australia. It's a phrase you hear in the East End of London. There are only two people that use the word mate. It's Australians and East Enders. It's probably a shipping term from first mate, second mate, etc. Because the country was built on Aboriginal genocide, and it was built on white slavery and Aboriginal slavery. So where are we today? We're today with a Prime Minister who has no integrity. A Prime Minister, when he was a lawyer in the 1980s, defended a whistleblower in a spy case, spy catcher case against the Brits, against the Brits. 
who wanted to silence his man. So Malcolm Turnbull today is serving as Julia Gillard did, as uh, what's his name, Abbott uh, did before him, the British Empire. They denied Julian Assange a passport. This building is denying an Australian citizen a passport. Now why did they do this? They do it because Australians find their security, not in peace and justice, not in reconciliation with Aboriginal people. These Australians find their, their security in serving empire. When the American Empire says jump, these Australians say, how high do you want us to jump? Who do you want us to land on? The Arabs, the Vietnamese, the Maori, the Turks? How hard do you want us to land on them? How high do you want us to jump? Who do you want us to land on? And how hard do you want us to land on them? Now this time, the unusual case of Julian Assange is that it's a white boy they're landing on. A white boy, a man who could be a multi-millionaire today in Silicon Valley. There's no one who could naysay that. No one could argue that Julian Assange would not be a multi-millionaire in Silicon Valley. If he put, like these people do, material wealth before humanity. Now Julian Assange has put humanity first. And Julian Assange knows, as many of us do, that wars, the first casualty of war is the truth. And he figured that if he told the truth, maybe that would stop a war. Maybe that would stop all war. And he and Chelsea Manning bet their life's liberty on that assumption. And maybe that bet was wrong, because they believed, if only you knew, that the children of Palestine and Iraq and Syria are being killed by your government, that you would have the compassion and empathy to respond, to speak out and act up non-violently. But no, you've embraced dogmatification. You've embraced that freedom, the only freedom you have, is at the point of consumption. The only freedom you have is the choice between Nike and Reebok, the choice between Coke and Pepsi, the choice between Chelsea and Manchester United. That's the only freedom you have. The only freedom you have. At least in the state of origin, you don't have that freedom. Um, so, some of us imagine human freedom as being a much more, much more multifaceted thing. That we imagine a society based on free speech as I'm exercising now. We imagine schools where it's a debate and discussion of university campuses where students again rise to the occasion and question the bullshit that's shoved down their throat by their overpaid academics. Some of us still hold on to that glimpse of freedom as you slowly walk, as you slowly walk towards fascism, as you slowly walk to World War III. And how do you do that? Well, you have Pine Gap, an NSA base near Alice Springs that never gets a mention in the media. Australia's best kept secret, unless people like Catholic workers break into that base, as we do with monotonous occasion. And you also welcome US nuclear warships. And when the New Zealand tried to do, stop that in the 80s, you, their Labor government pressured the New Zealand government and they leagued up with the Americans and they suspended military exercises. You know, you celebrate Ned Kelly as an anti-authoritarian and you should. Now Julian Assange is Australia's Ned Kelly of the present time, without the beard, without the guns, and without the unfortunate incident at Stringy Bar Creek. If you celebrate Ned Kelly, you should definitely celebrate Julian Assange. Yet they've done such a good job at character assassination such a good job of marginalisation of this man. I know this man personally, and that's why I'm emotionally upset by another day passing with his confinement without charge and sensory deprivation in this city. And none of you have interjected, none of you have naysayed anything I'm saying, because you know in your heart there's a truth. Even though you've turned into zombies, even though you've bought the bullshit, that you're immortal, because you're all going to die, okay? For me today, it could be 10, could be 20, could be 30 years, but you're all going to die. Now you've got to decide how you want to spend this precious time we have together. And how you kind of come to terms with your existence, the existential question of what the fuck am I doing here, and I'm not going to be here for fucking long. Your mortality is up to you. I find mine in Catholicism, in radical Christianity. My friend here finds hers in shamanism. Other people find theirs in all sorts of traditions and that's fine. 
That's their personal business. But you will not find any meaning in a building like this. All you will find is you sleepwalk, as you walk, as Jews walked into the governs of Auschwitz, as you line up and walk passively into this place, all you will find is power and privilege. All you will find is George Brandis selling out an Australian who had the courage to stand up to the US Empire, first when he was 17 in Melbourne, and again when he created WikiLeaks and exposed the crimes of the rich and powerful. Now I've spent two years in jail in the United States, in Texas and Louisiana, in Oklahoma and New York, in Ireland and Limerick, in Australia and Darwin and Brisbane. And I've spent many hours with uh, career armed robbers. And I, I know some really uh, very efficient ones. And they will tell you that people will stop robbing banks when banks stop robbing people. Now what that, that's an insight you only get from the margins. And what that points to is there's two sorts of crimes in our world. There's high crime and low crime. The criminals you'll meet tonight are involved in high crime with major governments and corporations. They do high-end theft and killing and dealing in dangerous substances. The people you meet in jail often aren't in there for heroically rebelling against capitalism. They're in there for mimicking capitalism. They haven't been born with the birthright of Brandis and Turnbull, of Bush and Cheney, of Trump to kill and thieve and deal, but they've mimicked them in their neighbourhood, a lot of them. And of course, in Australia, 30% of the Indigenous people are prisoners. They represent 2% of the general population. And they are, in reality, victims of historic crimes of theft and murder and rape. They have travelled right down their lineage. But there are many courageous Aboriginal people who have thrown off what they've been sentenced to and they're resisting. And they keep their culture and languages alive, which is a beautiful thing. Also, what an armed robber will tell you is that the best use of a weapon in an armed robbery is when it's not fired. When it's pointed to the head, and I've had guns pointed to my head, uh, by the US military in New York. And they say, um, and uh, that facilitates exploitation. Violence, explicit, explicit, exp violence enables exploitation to occur. And there will be no justice until there's, there's, there'll be no peace until there's justice. There's, there's a relationship between violence and exploitation and peace and justice. And um, I can tell you, I was with Julian in November, uh, that he isn't where the Brits and the Yanks and the Australian sycophants think it would be, curled up in the fetal position, crying himself to sleep. Julian is far from that. Julian is resolute, he believes in his mission, and he, uh, he will continue that mission at the cost of ever putting his feet on the sidewalk again, of ever walking in a rainforest again, ever seeing his children again, ever seeing his mother again, ever seeing his father again. That's the price Julian Assange pays as he experiences a slow motion crucifixion here in London. They've got a statue to Bomber Harris right over there. Bomber Harris is a mass murderer. Right down close to the neighbor. That statues of, of mass murderers right through the city that served the empire. You know, the statues of, uh, of Aboriginal resistors, of people like Julian Assange, will only be constructed after we liberate ourselves from, uh, from imperialism and capitalism and uh, the other shit they serve up in, as normalcy. Because it's not normal. It's not normal at all. It's high-scale terrorism and high-scale theft and high-scale exploitation. And it, it saddens me the state of Australians and um, usually young ones who are heavily sedated and distracted. So when I was growing up in the back of Gallipoli Army Barracks in Inogna, Brisbane during the Vietnam War, they wanted your firstborn child to go to Vietnam to kill and die for the Americans. Um, you know, they killed three million Vietnamese and Cambodians and Laotians doing that. All the, as, our, as our people go off to Afghanistan and Iraq now, all they ask of us at the centre of empire is to avert our gaze, to do what these people are doing tonight, to look the other way. And you can bet, there must be celebrities here, they're getting fast tracked in here. Against the plebs. The plebs aren't rising up against this privilege, but um, we'll see. You never know. Mm. There's always something. Um, so, um, so today, from Inogra Gallipoli Barracks, they deploy 
young Australians to the lost cause, the lost war they lost in Afghanistan years ago. Um, and they're deploying again to the Middle East where they got their asses kicked uh, when they went in under Bush Jr. So, uh, I don't know, after the failure of the Vietnam War, and I, I grew up with Vietnam veterans, so I grew up with uh, Mick O'Leary who fought on the Kokoda Trail, and uh, I worked with Jack Sherrington in the anti-war movement in the 70s, who fought in Bougainville. And these were veterans that knew they'd been exploited and their young people knew that they were lied to. And, uh, and they had very few illusions, you know. And uh, the illusions that are still strong that drag our young people into the military. And the Australian military, <laughs> they've been involved in about 14 wars. Only one could be described as defensive. In the First World War, as Malcolm Fraser reflected before he died, probably the best ex-Prime Minister we had, he said that this is where alliances get you. Australia invaded Turkey, not because Turkey was threatening Australia, but Australia was in alliance with Britain and Turkey was in alliance with Germany. So thinking that you're, to be in alliance with powerful people is actually the same thing Malcolm Fraser, the Conservative Prime Minister of Australia in the 70s, who we all used to hate, um, pointed out that no, those kind of alliances imperil your, imperil your children. So the only war, in World War I, the Irish Catholic Church in Australia defeated the government twice on the question of conscription. Because the Irish Catholic Church knew what the Brits did to Irish Catholics. They tortured them and they killed them. And they occupied their land for 800 years. So the Irish Catholic Mannix and other, other Irish Catholics knew that British imperialism was the enemy of Irish Catholics. And they defeated the government twice in referendums in World War, World War I. In World War II, they introduced conscription, but they said to the lads, you won't be going overseas, you're home defence. So the, the Australians, in typical fashion, send their best troops to North Africa, not to, fight, not to open a second front in Europe, to protect, protect the British trade routes to India. So when the Japanese enter the war, the Australians have no, no troops, and they send up conscripts to New Guinea, because New Guinea was the protectorate of Australia was handed over after World War One, and um, that's the only defensive battle that Australia has ever been involved in. They served British imperialism in Malaya, North Korea, American imperialism in Vietnam, Iraq and Afghanistan. And we send these young people off, we use them in the prime of their youth, and we, then we dispose of them. And we kind of, the high suicide rates amongst Australian veterans now is incredible. And uh, all we're asked to do, all these people do, is to avert their gaze like they're doing tonight, you know. And um, I'm supposed to be demoralised by that. I'm not demoralised. You only get dis disappointed in life uh, if you have expectations. My expectations of white Australians, somewhere down there. I get disappointed when Irish people, or young people, or people with long hair, go along with American wars. You know, maybe that's a subjective mistake I'm making, but um, that's how I get disappointed. So once you get disappointed, if you're going to go through life, you readjust your expectations. And my expectations of white Australians are pretty low after their abandonment of Julian Assange here in London. We began as a prison col colony of Britain. We should know what it's like to be a prisoner. Julian Assange has been a prisoner detained without charge in this city for eight long years. He has been confined for six years. You know, and if you can't empathise with that, you're a fucking zombie, okay? There's no, no, no doubt, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm only telling you this to help you, okay? Because you don't have to be a zombie. You can be a human being, you know? But that... I'm not protesting, sir. I'm exercising free speech. Something that Joe Bielke Peterson denied. I think he wants you off the run. Oh, right. Joe Bielke Peterson denied me in the 70s. You're okay? Yeah, it's done solid there.